All right, so yay, that seemed to have worked. Um, so we will get started. It is noon and I wanna be uh, cognizant of everyone's time. Some people might be taking a lunch break to get this webinar in. So I'll briefly do some introductions. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining today's webinar, the American Rescue Plan Act, what your board needs to know. This webinar will provide an overview of the American Rescue Plan or ARPA as it's called for short. Um, give you information on how the funding can be used and what kind of reporting is required. My name is Katie Malinowski and I am the Executive Director of the New York State Tug Hill Commission. For those of you who may not know, the Tug Hill region covers 2,100 square miles in portions of Jefferson, Lewis, Oneida, and Oswego counties. And the Commission is a small non-regulatory New York State agency that provides technical assistance in the program areas of land use planning, local governments, community and economic development, and natural resource management. A few housekeeping items for this webinar, you are muted and your video is turned off. Please enter your questions in the chat box, which some of you have already discovered at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer them throughout the presentation. Um, and today's presenter, thank you, is Sarah Brancatella, Council and Legislative Director for the Association of Towns of New York State. Uh, she coordinates AOT's legislative advocacy, regularly presents on new legislation and other areas of interest to towns, manages AOT's amicus brief program, and works on member inquiries. Sarah is a graduate of SUNY Geneseo and the University of Buffalo School University at Buffalo School of Law. So turning it over to you, Sarah, thank you. I knew that my cats would make an appearance. I'm not surprised they're feeling particularly feisty today, apparently. Um, just a few quick things to go over before I get started. If I say town, just know that I'm referring to towns and villages. I just say towns because that's the currency that I deal in day in, day out. Um, but it is applicable to village. Anything that I say is equally applicable to villages. Um, I was up late last night because the bills were on. If you don't know me, that means, or if, if I haven't mentioned that I'm from Buffalo, then you might not have talked to me for more than five minutes. I tell everybody from about that, that I'm from Buffalo. So it was a little bit of a late night, a little bit of a depressing event, but if I, if I take a sip of tea every once in a while, that's why. Um, there are a lot of questions about ARPA and Katie had mentioned the extended deadline now for the reporting requirements. I know that there's a lot of confusion with ARPA, and I think that's partially because it's sort of like building the plane while flying it. A lot of these things have evolved since the legislation originally came out. And in some ways it's frustrating because you feel like the goalpost keeps moving, but in other ways, it. I think things become clearer over time. Um, but I understand people's frustration and being like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on because heaven knows I have no idea what's going on ever. But I do know about ARPA, I can say that. Also, um, the Association of Towns has um, two written guides on ARPA online. One is about how the funds can be used. The other one is about rules that you have to follow for procurement when using ARPA funds. Those are available on our website at nytowns.org. And with that, I'm gonna get started. I like to start with this hypothetical question because I cannot tell you how many times a day I get the question, hey, can I use ARPA funds for XYZ? Can I use it for this project? Whatever. And it's really difficult to answer these questions because there's not really a specifically enumerated list of projects that are eligible. There are a few, and I'm gonna go over some of them, but a lot of it is how do you craft your argument for why it falls under one of the four enumerated categories? And I'm gonna go over that, but I just like to throw this out as an example. I'm gonna have it run through um, because really, if you ask me, hey, can I use ARPA money for this project? My response to you is, tell me why you can use it. Because ultimately you're going to be the ones who have to make the argument, who have to fill out the form explaining why this project is eligible under ARPA. So I know that there's a lot of gray areas, but I think with gray areas comes a lot of flexibility and thus a lot of opportunity. Um, and again, I'm just gonna use the park example throughout this to 
try and illustrate where there's this flexibility and how you can craft your arguments. Uh, just the first couple, you know, obviously, I think most of the stuff is already done, well done. You should have received your first installment from DOB no later than August, I want to say. Uh, metropolitan entities got their first installment from the Treasury. Your second installment will be distributed from DOB around the same time next year. And non-entitlement units should have received another much smaller um, check, or if you haven't received it yet, you will be receiving it you will be receiving one. That's because the non-entitlement units that declined ARPA funding, that money is put back into a pot and then redistributed among all of the other existing NEUs. I'm just, okay. I'm just checking the chat box every once in a while to make sure there are no questions. Okay. technological maven over here. Some general considerations when dealing with ARPA funds. Funds can generally be used to cover allowable costs that were incurred on or after March 3rd, 2021. I know that this is a source of frustration for uh, some people because you spent a lot of money on personal protective equipment before March 3rd, 2021. But ARPA is a forward-looking piece of legislation. So costs that were incurred, the project might have started before March 3rd, 2021, but the costs have to be incurred after that date. So it's not, again, it's not necessarily that you have to start the project before March 3rd or after March 3rd, 2021. It's just that the the costs have to be incurred after March 3rd, 2021. The deadline to obligate funds is December 31st, 2024. Obligate funds means there has to be a legal obligation, a legal contract. Um, it doesn't mean that the money has to be out the door, but there does have to be some sort of legal obligation to spend the funds. And then you actually have to have the money out the door out of your bank account by December 31st, 2026. So you have a lot of time to spend this money. And I've been telling people that over and over again, you have time to sit and wait. And if you're like, I'm not sure if this project is gonna be eligible, maybe you wanna see what other projects in your area or other towns have used their ARPA money on. And that will give you a better sense of if your project would be eligible depending on the argument that you make. A lot of people ask this question, um, what happens if I use the ARPA money for a project that is deemed ineligible? There's a whole appeals process. Um, you're going to get a notification. I don't think there's a deadline for the notification, but you're going to get a notification from the Treasury saying, hey, we don't think that this is the correct use of ARPA funds, then you have, I think it's 60 days to respond and you can provide more information on why actually, no, we think that this is eligible. Um, I would probably get your federal representatives involved at that point. So you do have another opportunity to present your side as to why this project would be eligible for ARPA funding. Ultimately, if it's not, if the Treasury deems that it's an incorrect use, then you would have to return money, ARPA money to the Treasury. But I think that they're going to be looking for really egregious abuses, not getting in the weeds on things. So, you know, you don't want to use ARPA funding to throw a pizza party for your employees, that's not really gonna be considered a correct use. And that's just blatantly obvious that it's not a correct use. So I think that's really what they're going to be looking for more closely um, once they review your reporting requirements. Other things, you might be able to fit the same project under different categories. This is again, in how you craft your argument. So just because you're not allowed or you can't fit a project under one category, maybe you're allowed, maybe you're able to fit it under another category. Highly, strongly, definitely recommend that you maintain records supporting your deter determination that a project is eligible, even if it's just a small paragraph. Um, keep the contracts, keep the town board minutes, I mean, which you already will have, but keep the conversation about why this project is eligible. There's no pre-approval of projects. AOT isn't, a pre, we're not the pre-approval of projects. I can give you my opinion. I can maybe help you craft arguments, but just because I think that something is 
might be a potential argument. Again, ultimately, you are going to be the ones who have to make this argument to the Treasury, and the Treasury has explicitly said that they are not doing any sort of pre-approval for projects. So what are the four major categories on how ARPA funding can be used? The first one is to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency or its negative economic impacts. The second is to provide premium pay to essential workers. The third, to cover loss of revenue, to provide general government services. And four, to make necessary investments in infrastructure, um, in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. The first category, the language of the statute says, ARPA funding can be used to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses, and nonprofits, or to assist impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. That is kind of a lot to unpack. And I like to think of the first category as being broken down into three subcategories. I think that's an easier way to categorize it in your mind. So I like to think of it as the first subcategory under the first big category would be you can use money, you can use ARPA money to respond to the COVID-19 uh, health emergency uh, supporting the public health response. The second one would be um, addressing the negative economic impacts of COVID. And then the third one would be assisting disproportionately impacted communities. That is this third subcategory, assisting disproportionately impacted communities, is kind of an interesting construct because it's not in the language of the legislation, but when the Treasury issued its guidance, um, when was it? In May, when they issued their guidance in May, they had this whole new section um, on disproportionately impacted communities under this first area, under this first category. And there's a decent amount of flexibility that goes with that. So even though you're not gonna find that specific, the, that specific language or that term in the language of the statute, you will find it referenced in the guidance and in the treasury regulations that came out. So that again is the third little subcategory under this first category. 1A under the first category, responding to the public health emergency slash supporting public health. The regulations have a list of eligible uses under this category. Um, if your proposed use is not specifically listed, and then on the next slide I have of the specifically listed uses, such as expenses for PPE, um, expenses to disinfect public area. So if you need extra cleaning, extra janitorial services in, um, in the town hall, then in order to prevent the spread, the spread of COVID-19, then you would be able to spend ARPA money on that. I know a lot of towns have been thinking about the specifically enumerated use of expenses for improving ventilation systems in public facilities. So using this as an opportunity to improve that in your town hall or in other town buildings. Also, I, I'm not gonna go through the entire list of what's listed. If you go to our guide on nytowns.org, I actually have listed out every single thing that's listed, even if they aren't necessarily obviously applicable to towns. Um, payroll and benefits for public employees, but only to the extent that your time is spent mitigating and responding to COVID-19. So again, this is under the first category. Under the first category, you are allowed to spend ARPA money to pay your employees, to pay town or village employees, but under this first category, it can only be for public employees who have spent their time mitigating or responding to COVID-19. You are going to need to um, do things like keep records of the payroll and attestations from supervisors, something to demonstrate what percentage of this individual's time was dedicated to responding to COVID-19. And this is different than the essential category, the premium pay for essential workers category. That's the second one that I'm going to go over because with this one, you can actually use ARPA money to pay for the underlying salary, like the base pay of this. The second category with the premium pay, that's the whipped cream and cherry on top. You're not allowed to use ARPA funds to pay for the base salary there, but you are allowed to pay the base salary using ARPA funds if you fit it under this first category um, and again, only to the extent that an employee has spent their time mitigating COVID-19. Public health and safety employees can be assumed to spend all of their time responding to COVID-19. So if you have um, police officers in your town or village or um, 
ambulance workers wouldn't really apply, but police officers would be considered um, a public health and safety employee. And you can assume that they spent all of their time responding to it. Otherwise, you're going to have to have some documentation showing what percentage of time uh, this employee spent mitigating. And again, these are forward looking costs. Um, they have to be costs that are incurred on or after March 3rd. I see somebody has their hand raised, but if you just want to, if that was an accident, I don't know. But if you want to um, have questions, you can type them in the chat bo box and I will take a look at them. So let's say that your proposed project is not specifically enumerated under the regulations when there is a question. What about DPW workers? So I think that there is an argument to make that those would be considered public health and safety employees. I'm not sure if they're specifically listed, but I think that that fits pretty neatly under there. I mean, I would go and double check in the guidance to see uh, if there's more discussion on what constitutes a public health and safety employee. See, the treasury guidance and stuff likes to give, like throw out these phrases and use broad terms like public health and safety employees because they wanna capture a lot of individuals. They wanna capture a lot of the nuances. They don't wanna be so strict that you can't do it. But with being so broad comes a lot of ambiguity. I think that there's a strong argument to make that a DPW worker would be considered a public health and safety employee, especially if, um, you know, they worked the entire time during teen and came into came into contact. So I can't give you a definitive answer on that. Um, I would go back again and read through the guidance to see maybe if there's more of a fleshed out discussion. I know specifically they talk about police officers and ambulance workers, but I don't think that it's necessarily limited to those positions. So again, let's say that your proposed use is not specifically listed under this first category, under this 1A of eligible ARPA uses. The Treasury guidance says, if the proposed use is not on the list, um, the interim rule suggests that you use this analysis to determine the eligibility. Identify the effect of COVID-19 on public health, those already felt or those that may manifest over the years, and then assess how the proposed use of funds would respond to or address the effect of COVID-19 response and prevention. So the key thing here is that you always want to link it back to a response to COVID-19. The first one is the first 1A, you really want to focus on public health and how it deal, like how it connects to COVID-19. I know one person, I had talked to one person who gave a creative argument saying, well, what about um, what about if we used ARPA money to pay for road maintenance because you need road maintenance to in order for ambulances to um, to drive to be able to get to the hospital and for essential workers to be able to get to and from work safely. And I was like, I like your creativity. I like that you're thinking outside of the box, but I think that that might be a little bit too tenuous a connection because you're gonna need road maintenance anyway. Um, this is stuff that COVID-19 has really, if COVID-19 had resulted in an increased um, need for road maintenance, I could see a better argument for it. But this is really like, what sort of stress did COVID-19 put on your facilities, on, on your services, on your ability to perform these services? What sort of strain did COVID-19 put on this? And, and how did it impact public health? And then how is your proposed use going to address that? So again, this is really where you can get pretty creative um, and really craft your argument uh, for why your proposed project fits under there, under that first 1B category. The second subcategory under this first, cat, first major category would be neg negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. Again, there are a list of specifically enumerated eligible projects that the Treasury has released as part of their interim rules and guidance. But what if your proposed use is not on the list? So again, you have this kind of broad analysis that says to determine whether a program or service not specifically listed in the regulations would be eligible to use in response to a negative economic impact. One, assess whether the service or program experienced economic harm from COVID. Two, would the planned use of funds respond to this economic harm? 
So, you know, I know this is not a real world example, but I think it really illustrates this point. You wouldn't be able to, let's say, give money to Amazon to help them get through the pandemic or you responding to the negative economic impacts of COVID-19 because they did not, in fact, experience any negative economic impacts. They got even larger. So this is focused on those who actually experienced negative economic impacts as a result of COVID. The response has to be proportional and related. So hypothetically speaking, let's say that somebody can say, hey, I lost $50,000 as a result of, it's an economic harm that I felt from COVID-19. You can't give them then $100,000. It would have to be proportional to the $50,000. What you don't want to do is give a small business, um, a nonprofit, a windfall, some of the specifically enumerated uses under this 1B subcategory would be assistance to small businesses and nonprofits, assistance to impacted industries such as tourism, assistance to unemployed workers, rehiring state, local, and tribal government staff. I have this one starred multiple times in my own notes because the treasury guidance and the interim rule says that a negative economic impact could include decreases to a state or government, local government's ability to effectively administer services. That to me is pretty interesting. And one of the examples that they give the FAQ is, let's say that your justice court, because it was not able to be open and operating dur during COVID-19, um, you've got this huge backlog of cases because you know, you're trying to get through it and you need to hire more staff to help get through this, or you need to buy new equipment do something to help facilitate getting through this backlog of cases more quickly. That is an example that they say would be eligible under this negative economic impact because the negative economic impact of COVID was that the town was not able to provide this service. And now they need money to sort of like get back up to speed, which is a really interesting subcategory again, um, I think that in the Treasury FAQ, if you go to the Treasury's website, um, and also there are links to the FAQ in the guidance that AOT has put out, and I'm sure that NICOM has links to it on their website as well. But look at questions 2.18 and 2.19. I think those are really interesting examples of decreases to a state or local government's ability to effectively administer services. And I think that there's a lot of room, um, a lot of flexibility using that as a framework. Something to keep in mind, because obviously I talked about you can give money to small businesses or nonprofits. New York State has to deal with Article 8, Section 1 of the New York State Constitution. That's the prohibition on gifts and loans to private entities. It is not a violation Eight, section one, if money to a private entity serves a proper public use, the public benefits overall and the private benefit is incidental. One of the biggest questions that we get asked is on eligible ARPA uses would be firefighting and fire departments, not-for-profit fire companies. Are you eligible to, uh, can you use your ARPA money for that? And one thing that I always say is, okay, well, can the fire company establish that they experienced economic harm as a result of COVID-19? Um, maybe they weren't able to hold fund a fundraiser, uh, maybe their budget shrink, whatever. Are they able to establish that they had a negative economic impact as a result of COVID-19? If so, then yeah, I mean, you are allowed to give money to nonprofits. And I think that that's a perfect example of, it's a proper public use, it benefits the public overall, and the private benefit is incidental because they are serving a public purpose. You know, you'd, you wouldn't want it, again, going back to the pizza party example, you wouldn't want it to be used for throwing a pizza party or something, but you do want the benefit to be for the public overall. Um, I have hedgehogs because, I'm an attorney, so I like to hedge. And so these hedging hedgehogs want you to remember that Article 8, Section 1 exists if you are thinking about giving money to a nonprofit or a small business in your community. This third sort of subcategory under the first big 
main category would be assisting hardest hit or disproportionately impacted communities. What are considered hardest hit communities? Well, um, one way to define that would be within a qualified census tract. Um, that is an area that's designated by HUD in which 50% or more of households have an income level of less than 60% of the median gross income or the area or poverty level is 25% or greater. Long story short, check with HUD. HUD is gonna be the one who designates your area as a qualified census tract. Go to their website, see if you have one in your area. The town board or the village board is also able to make a determination that another area or population is disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. You are There is a certain level of self-determination that you are allowed to do with this. However, if you are going to say that a particular region or a particular um, population was disproportionately impacted, you better be able to provide an argument and documentation for why. You can't just say, well, you know, we think that this group was disproportionately impacted. We think that this group was hit really, really hard. No, you better give me a better answer than that. And by me, I mean the treasury. You better give the treasury a better answer than that. And explain why exactly this is considered a disproportionately impacted group. So again, there is a certain level of self-determination, but you want to be able to show the receipts back up your argument. Don't just say it, show me why. God, I sound like my high school teachers. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't tell me, Sarah, show me. Anyway, so with this eligible, like with this hardest hit disproportionately impacted um, communities or populations, eligible services are a little bit more broad. There's a lot more flexibility if you are providing services to a disproportionately impacted community. Um, you are allowed to spend money to remediate lead paint, um, increase affordable housing development, provide services to address homelessness, uh, promote healthy childhood environments build stronger communities through investments in housing and neighborhoods. Those are some of the specifically enumerated uses. And you can see that they're not, with the first two subcategories under the big category, they're really linked to COVID-19. You have to relate everything back to COVID-19. This, you don't really have to link it back to COVID-19 if you are providing a service to um, a disproportionately impacted community. I mean, I guess you could say that the link is, I mean, the connection to COVID-19 would absolutely be that they were disproportionately impacted by COVID, but the services that you're able to provide to a disproportionately impacted community don't have to um, be in service of mitigating COVID-19. There's a lot more flexibility with this. So going back to my first hypothetical question, can we fit improvements to a park under this first category? I'm going to tell you the arguments that I would make. So, and you know what, I'm not even gonna go back to the slides. I'm just gonna tell you the arguments that I would make. I think that there's a few different arguments that you could make. Number one, is this park in a disproportionately impacted community? Because, uh, if it is serving a disproportionately impacted community, I think that you could fit it under you are promoting healthy childhood environments or you're building stronger communities through investments in housing and the neighborhood. So I definitely think that there's an argument to be made that if you spend ARPA money to improve and to improve parks that um, is in a disproportionately impacted community, that would I think that there's a strong argument to craft that that would be an eligible use. Also. Let's look at this other category of, okay, I mean, I guess I am going to go back here, right? Let's go back to this other 1B category of a negative economic impact could include decreases to a state or local government's ability to effectively administer services. Let's say that you ran um, a summer program through your parks and you weren't able to provide that because of COVID-19 and maybe your parks were used more often than they had otherwise been because people were trying to go outside, you know, find outdoor spaces instead of going indoor to try and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So let's say that you don't have this income coming in from your summer programs and your parks were used a lot more because people are trying to get outside to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. 
then I think you have an argument for some improvements to bring the to bring your part back up to snuff, up to par. Potentially, you could fit it under this decreases to a state or like COVID-19 decreased your ability to effectively administer park services. Here's why. So I think that you could potentially, depending on your circumstance, craft an argument for why that would fit under there. So those are just two examples of how I think maybe you could make the argument that a park, it's not a specifically enumerated list. Like it's not specifically enumerated. Parks are not specifically listed in the interim guidance or the regs. But using the flexibility that the Treasury has given and using the analysis um, that they've provided, I think that you I think that there are definitely arguments to make about why you could fit a park under there. I'm also not pulling this park example out of thin air either. Um, I'm pretty confident in them because the Treasury also discusses them in their FAQ and different ways that you can argue that um, that a park would fit under that category. General considerate general considerations if you are considering spending ARPA funds under this first category, always connect the uses if you're going to go with 1B, 1A, always connect the uses as responding to some aspect of COVID-19. And again, I'm, I'm actually going to include disproportionately impacted communities with that, because again, they're disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, so always connect it back to COVID-19. Your money should always be spent responding to some impact of COVID-19 um, or linked to COVID-19 in some way. Keep records of how your project or how the assistance provided to small businesses responds to the health emergency or the negative economic impacts. Good record keeping is gonna save you time in the long run. The second major category of how you're allowed to use ARPA funding would be to provide premium pay to essential workers. Um, the specific statute says to provide premium pay to workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Eligible worker under this category means workers that are needed to maintain a continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure, infrastructure sectors. I don't like reading that. Like, Sometimes when I read these sentences out loud, I'm like, who wrote this? Like, it just sounds like such a robot lawyer talk to me sometimes. So breaking that down, what are some lists of essential sectors? Healthcare, public health and safety, childcare, education, sanitation, transportation. Those are some areas of essential sectors that that the Treasury has specifically think they, they, they specifically think are considered essential sectors. There's also again a level of self determination involved. The town board or village board has the discretion to add to this list, so long as the sectors are considered critical to protect the health and well being of residents. So, if you are going to provide premium pay to an essential worker um, in an essential sector that's not listed here make sure that you have an argument for why this area is considered an essential sector. I actually think that there's like a really decent argument um, for like town clerks um, issuing it. town, town, or I mean, transportation is easy. Like the highway superintendent fits under there, but like town clerks provided services throughout COVID-19. And I think that even though they don't neatly fit under any of these essential sectors, I think the town board has the discretion to say, you know what, the town clerk, they they posted notices, they issued marriage licenses in charge of vital records, which weren't exactly put on pause during the COVID-19 public health emergency. So I think that there's a strong argument to make for um, an entity like the town, an entity, a position like the town clerk to be considered an essential sector or the town board. Yeah. Even, even the board supervise your elected officials who are out there doing the work. It's not like your work stopped because of COVID-19. However, there are some further um, restrictions on this. So essential work means work involving regular in-person interactions with the public or coworkers or regular physical hand handling of items that were also handled by others during the COVID-19 public health emergency. So you can't be a town board member who has been zooming into your meetings for the last 
18 months and not had to interact with anybody and say you are doing essential work. The idea behind this premium pay for essential workers is to compensate them, to, to give them some, something extra, given the extra risk that they took on. So again, this does not include telework performed. Um, the Treasury would like to see you prioritize lower income eligible workers that perform essential work, and you can provide grants to third party employers with eligible workers performing essential work. One thing that immediately comes to mind is let's say that you contract for janitorial services. They are considered sanitation is considered part of uh, it's considered an essential sector. The DPW definitely falls under under this. And if they continued to work in person during the COVID-19 health emergency, you would be able to provide pr premium pay to them under this. I had sort of mentioned this before when I talked about paying for like paying for public health workers or public health and safety workers under the first category. And I said that you could, you could use it for their base salary to the extent that their time was spent mitigating COVID-19. And I, and I purposely focused on the base salary here and said, in contrast, under the second category, it's premium pay. It is the whipped cream and cherry and sprinkles on top of your ice cream sundae. You are not allowed to use ARPA funding under the second category to pay for the base salary. Um, it's up and above additional beyond what they would otherwise be paid. And you can pay up to $13 per hour to an eligible worker in addition to other wages received. Um, it can be applied retroactively going back to January 27th, 2020. This is one of the few areas where you're allowed to look back. There's a look back period. Because remember, I said that costs have to be incurred on or after March 3rd. But with this, you can actually have a look back period going back to the beginning of 2020. Um, that makes sense too, to me. That like as a policy matter, that makes sense. And the Treasury actually encourages focusing on retroactive pay and performance um, and focusing again on lower income workers. There are some limitations on the amount of premium pay that you can provide somebody. You can't exceed $25,000 to any one person. Um, if the premium pay would increase the wage above 150% of these averages, then you have to provide a written justification to the treasury. If you are wondering what the average annual wage is in New York State for your area or for your county in your area, you can take a look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Occupational Employment and Wage Statistics. What about limitations on raising salaries for elected officials? This is, um, as town officials would know, there is a limitation on raising the salary of an elected official like the town supervisor above the amount that's listed in the notice for the preliminary here notice for the public hearing on the preliminary budget my recommendation would be if you want to at, so if the premium pay would make it above and beyond the salary that's listed in that notice on the public hearing for the preliminary budget adopt a local law nunc pro tonk um, just if you find yourself in that situation, just shoot AOT an email. Um, can we fit improvements to a park under the second category? I think the answer to this is a fairly obvious no. Um, how are you allowed to provide premium pay to town supervisors and town clerks when their pay is controlled by the budget? I mean, the budget is a living, breathing document. The limitation on increasing salaries is limited to you can't increase the salary above what's listed in the notice on the public hearing for the, the preliminary budget. But yeah, they're, they're, it's a living, breathing document. So again, if you find yourself in that situation, you can just adopt, you can adopt a local law. I think you would be able to adopt a local law, nunc pro tonc. Um, that's sort of like adopting a local law that would be effective retroactively. Um, yeah, again, if you find yourself in that situation, give AOT a call, but you are allowed to increase the salary of elected officials throughout the year, um, just so long as it doesn't go above that, that ceiling that's set by the public notice for town workers. Third category, recovering lost revenue to provide general government services. This is probably my favorite category because I think it provides, it's the easiest to fit stuff under and it provides the most flexibility. So you can use ARPA funding for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, blah, 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 blah. 
Is there lost revenue? Did your town or village lose revenue? And if you did, what can you use the funds on? If you lost revenue, you can use the funds on general government services. That is a really, really broad category. Revenue is defined as tax revenue and anything generated from the underlying economy. So justice court fees, licensing fees, um, fines, anything like that. Revenue does not include proceeds from debt issuance, um, sales and investments, and revenue from utilities. That's a big one that we get asked about often. And you would sum up lost revenue across all revenue streams. So let's say that you lost money in your justice court area, you lost revenue in your justice court area, but you made a killing in mortgage recording tax, the mortgage recording tax is going to offset the loss of um, the justice court fines and fees for the purposes of determining lost revenue with ARPA. There are a couple of really helpful calculators out there. Um, and if you want, um, I'm happy to share that with Katie afterwards um, and she can distribute it to you, but there are helpful calculators um, to, to help you figure out how much revenue you might have lost. You can uh, calculate lost revenue as of four points in time. So 2020, at the end of the year, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. And what's really helpful is that any decrease in revenue is considered related to COVID-19. So you don't have to establish that the loss in revenue was because of COVID-19. The regulations assume that you lost revenue because of COVID-19. So that takes a burden off of you guys. There is, if you don't want to use a calculator, if you are a person, there is a whole formula that you are allowed to use that, that you should use that the treasury puts out for how to calculate lost revenue. Basically you determine your base year revenue. So when, you, let's, when you're determining the lost revenue for 2020, look and see what was your revenue in 2021. Then you wanna estimate what your counterfactual revenue was. And that would be revenue, like the bizarro world revenue. Let's say that COVID-19 didn't happen. What do you think um, your estimated revenue would be? And you are allowed to use either a 4.1% average annual growth rate, or you can take a look at your last three years and take the average of the annual growth rate. So let's say that, you know, you had a really you had a lot of revenue coming in and you're like, well, wait a second, we predicted, we projected a revenue growth rate of 6%, then you can use that if that's the average over the last three years. Um, so whichever is higher, 4.1% or, or you're at, or the other, the other number that you come up with, um, you would determine the actual revenues collected during each 12 month period. So you would take a look at what was actually collected under like during 2020, for example, and then lost revenue would is equal to the estimated revenue minus the actual revenue for each period. So again, it's sort of like, what did we think we were going to get? How are we going to figure out what we think that we were going to get? Again, you can use either 4.1% or your annual average revenue, um, anticipated revenue for the, I'm sorry, for the last three years. So yeah, um, lost revenue is equal. So it's just like taking what you think you would have in revenue minus what you actually got in revenue, and that would be your lost revenue. But again, there are calculators to help this. And clearly, I am not the best at math, as that might be obvious as I stumble over things like formulas. Okay, questions. Would pilot revenue fall under the utilities revenue category? Um, like on wind farms and solar farms? That's a great question. My personal feeling, my personal feeling is that no, because pilots are not utility fees. They are meant to um, be used in place of taxes. So if the definition of general revenue is, um, you know, anything that's like tax based or based on the underlying economy. It's just, I consider pilots a, a variation on your tax base. So my opinion is, and other people might differ on this, but my opinion is, is that pilot lost revenue um, or pilot revenue would fall under general revenue and not utilities because pilots are not a form of utility payment. They are in fact meant to replace property taxes. That is the argument that I would make. That's 
that's my line. I'm sticking to that for now. Do budgeted incomes for 2020 have any impact on this? So again, you're going to calculate lost revenue during four periods of time. You're going to take a look and see what you lost during 2020, what you lost during 2021, what you lost during 2022. So you're going to actually perform this lost revenue calculation four different times. You're not going to do it just once. Um, you're going to do it annually to determine. So your budgeted incomes for 2022 have nothing to do with your lost revenue from 2020 or 2021. Um, I hope that answers that question. So what can you use lost revenue funding on um, general government services? This is really broadly defined and it is like maintenance of infrastructure, including highway, provision of police, fire, and other public safety, um, building infrastructure that would be used uh, with cash on hand, modernizing cybersecurity. General government services is just, it is broad. It encompasses a lot. And there are a few specifically enumerated things that are not considered general government services, and I think those are instructive. So expenses associated with debt are not included general government services, satisfaction of court judgments, or replenishing reserves. That's not a general government service. But other, I like, there's a lot of stuff, I, a ton of stuff that falls under general government services. Um, the, I, the satisfaction of judgment makes sense because that's not a government service that you're providing. Um, replenishing reserves, you, that's not necessarily a, a service that you're providing. So I, those are specifically prohibited, um, excluded from the definition of general government service. But yeah, if you have lost revenue, um, if you do your calculations and you have lost revenue for any of those four-year periods, then that is your pot of ARPA gold, because you can use it for a lot of different things, including but not limited to highway infrastructure, highway repair. So can we fit improvements to a park under this category? Sure can, I would say, because if you have your lost revenue, you are allowed to, again, spend it for general government services. A park, I think, is definitely considered a general public, a general government services. Um, Maintaining parks, providing parks, that, I, yeah, that's that's a general government service. So that's another area that you would be able to fit improvements to a park. I think that that is the easiest one to do. Um, yeah, it's, it's the most clear cut. If you can fit anything under the revenue services, I recommend, like, I think that you should take a look at, if you have lost revenue, like that's, go to that one first. But let's say that you have a few different projects in mind and your lost revenue was only like $5,000 and you want to, and you have $20,000 in ARPA money and you want to make improvements to your park, but you also want to make improvements to a culvert or something. Culvert is going to easily fit under lost revenue. Park, you could craft the argument for why it fits under the first category. So, you know, be mindful of how you categorize your projects. Um, and that is what I mean when I said some projects are eligible under some categories, but they're not eligible under other categories. And some projects you can fit under more than one category, depending on the argument that you make. So just be mindful of the level of latitude and flexibility um, involved under each category. But yeah, general revenue for your lost revenue for general government services, that is my favorite. I love that one. The fourth major category would be to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. This one is really um, pretty straightforward. An eligible project is one that's eligible under the Clean Water State Revolving Fund or the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. It's not that you have to apply under the CWSRF and the DWSRF and then also you don't have to apply under those programs for ARPA money to be eligible. Um, these programs include things like constructing, improving, repairing wastewater treatment, pan, tre treatment plants, um, install or replace treatment and distribution systems, building a new building new infrastructure or replacing infrastructure on on in water districts. There, it's a really broad category. Um, a lot of a lot of projects are eligible under the CWSRF and DWSRF, and 
in the AOT guide, there are links to some documents that help you analyze and determine what, what projects are eligible under these two different programs. How about feasibility studies? So I know, so again, you're, one, you're gonna to have to go back to the CWSRF and the DWSRF. I know that in some circumstances, depending on the project planning, the planning phase is eligible, is allowable um, under the CWSRF and the DWSRF. I, that is a huge, you could get really, really in the weeds on those two things. You could be an attorney just specializing in those two things, in the CWSRF and the DWSRF entirely. I am not that attorney, shockingly. Um, but these documents that are available, even if you just Google the two of them, um, the, the, the federal government has some pretty decent um, guides for if a project is eligible. And I know depending on the type of study uh, or depending on the type of project, a lot of planning phases, so like a feasibility study, um, architect, if you have to hire an architecture, things like that, that, those would be considered eligible. But yeah. Okay. Broadband infrastructure. Sorry. You can also use ARPA money under the fourth category for investments in broadband infrastructure. It has to be going to unserved or underserved area. There are certain um, speed requirements. There's a the treasury prioritizing, prioritizes achieving last mile connections, um, laying a fiber optic cable, um, using smaller nonprofit cooperative providers, not larger ones like Verizon. I think that this is a little bit difficult for New York local governments because there are some, there are a lot of restrictions, but that is, that is available. You are allowed to spend ARPA money to invest in broadband infrastructure in underserved or unserved areas. Some general considerations, you cannot use ARPA funding to cover pension funds. You can transfer money to another unit of local government, um, a special unit, a special purpose unit of local government. By that, I mean your water districts, your sewer districts. You are able to transfer money to those. So if you have a water project that is eligible under the CWSRF, you can transfer ARPA money to your water, like your water district fund and use it in there. Just because it's only serving part of your population, that doesn't preclude you from using ARPA funds. Also, I think it's helpful about the, you can transfer money to another unit of local government. I know that there have been several um, communities that have thought about, have been working with their counties on countywide projects. And some towns are considering transferring money to the county um, because the county might have the authority to do certain projects. The county might have more lost revenue, so they have more flexibility. There might be a myriad of reasons why you would want to transfer money to another unit of local government. So that is, I think initially the response would be like, well, why the heck would I do that? That doesn't seem like a good idea, but potentially it could be a good idea. And we always love inter like intermunicipal services, shared services. Um, so that's a perfect example of that. But if you transfer money to another entity, so let's say that you do transfer money to the county, you are still responsible for ensuring that the county or whatever unit of local government spends the money in accordance with the allowable use. So you want to have a monitoring system or a record keeping system in place um, with the other unit of local government just to make sure that things are used properly. The reporting requirements, um, Katie was like, yeah, we're gonna go over the reporting requirements. And I thought to myself, well, are we, are we gonna go over them? Because as I'm sure most of you know, originally the idea was that you were going to have to submit your first report on Halloween of this year. And then on October 1st, or I think it was maybe September 30th, the treasury announced that they were actually going to extend the deadline until April 30th, 2022. So you are not going to have to submit your report. You've got a lot of time. And I think one of the reasons that they did that is because they didn't have um, guidance ready on that. So the reporting is not something that we know a ton about at this point. And the Treasury keeps saying that they are going to be issuing guidance um, on how and where to file reports. You're going to have to do it through SAM.gov, I assume. 
So, but like what's required under the ports, under the reports and how to fill this information out, that information is forthcoming. I don't have a ton to share with you right now, um, other than wait and see. NICOM and AOT will tell you when that information becomes available, I promise. I know under, when you take a look at the reporting requirements for metropolitan entities, generally the structure is they have like seven major expenditure categories, revenue replacement, public health, negative economic impact, services to disproportionately impacted communities, premium pay, infrastructure, and administrative. Um, so they have like these major categories and you have to fit your project under the major category and then one of the subcategories. So this again is gonna be your, op when you spend your ARPA money, have this in mind of how you are going to categorize your, like your use. And I would use these seven major expenditure categories. Absolutely, I, I think that you can definitely rely on these. So think to yourself, okay, I want to use my ARPA money on improvements to parks. I'm going to fit that under services to disproportionately impacted communities. Just have your categories in mind before you actually spend the money. Um, I think that is the best way to handle that. Yeah, before you spend money, know how you're gonna categorize the expenditure. And again, you must maintain records and financial documents for five years, I believe. Um, yep, five years after all program funds have been spent or returned to the treasury. So you're gonna to have to keep those for a while until 2031, if you don't spend your treasury money until the end of December, 2026. So you'll be keeping those records on file. Um, yeah, that's a long time, but miscellaneous things to take into account. Get a If you don't have a SAM.gov account, get it, you need it. Originally we were told that you don't need a SAM.gov account, you do, get it. You are allowed to use ARPA funds to pay for an ARPA consultant. Um, if you want to hire an outside consultant to help you, to help you craft these arguments for how it's going to be um, categorized and the records that you should keep in order to justify your expenses to the treasury, you can hire a consultant using ARPA money. You still have to follow competitive bidding, prevailing wage, your procurement policy. AOT put out a whole guide on using um, ARPA funds and procurement because there are additional federal rules that apply beyond what's available under GML article, uh, GML section 103 and your local procurement policy. So just be aware that there's this additional, additional level of federal rules. Um, and then also minor thing, I don't think that this, I, I just bring this up. If you spend $750,000 in federal funding combined, then you are subject to a, um, to a federal audit under the Single Audit Act. I don't necessarily think that applies again, but like, let's say that you have FEMA funding too and ARPA funding and it, you have to lump all of your federal funding together. And if that exceeds $750,000, then you're subject to, um, to this audit. Are there specific requirements for a consultant? Um, I mean, I'm not sure what you, like if, like if you're going to use ARPA funds for a consultant, do you have to, does it have to be a certain type of consultant or do they have to have certain credentials? No, not according to the treasury guidance, nothing like that. I know that in our procurement guide, we have a list of some entities that we know are providing consulting services, but there's not, it's not like you have to be specifically licensed to consult um, and advise on, on federal funds or anything like that, or be an accountant. So that's my cat, the other one, different from the one that came on screen before, but I'm happy to take any other questions. Thanks, Sarah. That was a lot of information. And thank you for answering the questions as we went along too. But now is your chance, folks. I see a few are dropping off, but we'll stay on and answer some questions um, specifically if you have them. So please uh, either raise your hand or type in the chat. I know um, Joe Rollins asked me about providing some links 
afterwards. We, we send out an email to everyone with links to the recording. We'll try to modify that email. It is a bit um, automatically generated, but we'll, we'll somehow we'll get you some of these links that Sarah has been talking about. I've been trying to stick some of them in the chat as she was going, but I couldn't, couldn't Google all the, all the things she was referencing quite fast enough, but we will try, do our best to get those links to you. Almost all of the links that I've referenced are included in the guide that AOT have. We have embedded links in there. Almost all of them. Like I don't have one to like HUD and disproport like what's considered a qualified census tract, but pretty much every other link is embedded in that guidance. Perfect. Thank you. Um, not seeing any additional questions. So um, like Sarah said, uh, I think they were hoping <laughs> his Tug Hill Council and ARPA um, move, they're coming too fast. And uh, ARPA approved consultant. Well, first of all, I think Sarah just said there's no actual approved ARPA consultants, but there are people you can use. I do not believe the Tug Hill Commission or the Cooperative Tug Hill Council would really qualify as an ARPA consultant, but we'll try to, you know, give you the information that you need uh, if you ask us questions. Um, Oh, I had a thought and then I just lost it, but uh, let's see what else we've got coming here. Yeah, I will definitely send the lost revenue calculator to Katie to send out. Um, Making a note of that right now. We had a question about Montague is planning on using the money for a new town barn well. Seems very clear cut that this is infrastructure enhancement is clear. Again, my, my question to you is what category does it fit under? Tell me why it fits on, tell me why. Um, tell me what category it fits under. And yeah, that, that would be my response. I think the most obvious one is lost revenue. There's the most flexibility with lost revenue. Um, but depending on this, there might be a water project attached to that and that would be eligible under CWSRF funds. So you can also break down projects and, and fit parts of projects under different categories. So with like the town barn part, maybe, maybe there's a water project, water element or sewer element to it. And you could use ARPA funds under the fourth category in addition to the third category. Um, so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and that is actually for a well for the town barn. So it might be easier to, it's not the town barn itself, I don't believe. So it might be easier to make the argument. I, what I was going to say is, you know, I think when we set up this, this webinar, we thought that there would be more guidance coming out from Treasury for the reporting because of that deadline coming up. But because the deadline got pushed out, um, there's no guidance. Um, and I, Sarah and I were chatting before we started, and uh, Sarah is very willing to do another webinar for us in the spring, you know, when that deadline starts to get closed and there is hopefully final, some final guidance from Treasury on the reporting. So keeping your fingers crossed, I see. Yeah. Um, is this recorded program going to be? Yep. So we've, we've been streaming live to YouTube as um, Sarah has been presenting. So actually, as soon as we're done uh, within you know, 10 or 15 minutes, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, but we'll have a link to the recording also in that follow-up email. I just want to quickly apologize for all of the ums and a little bit being a little bit tongue tied again. I was up way past my bedtime only to have my heart broken by the bills. So, <laughs> yes, Joe is uh, is commiserating with you. He said the bills game was heartbreaking, but he says it was slightly offset by the Red Sox win, which is, you know, depending on whether you're a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan. But I guess if the Yankees are out, maybe you'll root for the Red Sox. I'm I'm agnostic on baseball. <laughs> All right, so seeing no more further questions, thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Sarah, for your presentation. You're always a joy to listen to, lots of information and you make it interesting. So again, thanks for making yourself available. Well, thanks for having me, Katie. Always happy to help out Tug Hill.